For better or worse, we all have parents. These are mine, Phyllis and Harold. It's your yoga plane. So why are you walking up to back? I don't understand. Why are you walking up to back? They've been married to each other for 55 years. Look at that. That's where you always are. Yes. Anytime one I'm wants. Not always, but I mean. So it, Most it, of the time. It's 16 hours a day, yeah, probably. Yes. I was in there. <laughs> and what about the other? Okay, so the oh, other. There. I spend some time in my checkbook. But more in this chair. Well, he yeah. takes, uh, this chair is honored with a number of little catnaps every day. And then how many hours do you sleep? I don't sleep much. She thinks I sleep, but I don't sleep. I snore, but I don't sleep. She doesn't believe it. She doesn't believe it. I, I have to look up the definition of sleep because you're not getting away with that either of you. Phyllis. Harold. Since about the time I became conscious, I've been trying to figure out who these people are and what they're doing together. I've asked them so many questions over so many years, but still, I can't figure it out. I met Phyllis at a New Year's Eve party in Far Rockaway at the home of my classmate from Ohio State University, where we were uh, I was doing my undergraduate work in 1939. I came with a date, and he came with a date, and the party was in Far Rockaway in a lot of rooms because there were a lot of people, so people were going in and out of rooms. Drinking and, uh, you know, dancing, and the, the days of, you know, uh, mambo and all that. Cha, cha, cha. Before he went home, when they were in their coats, he walked over to me. I was sitting with a lot of people, and he asked me for my telephone number. And he was very cute. He was slim, and he had dimples, and I gave him my telephone number. When I came back in the summertime, that's when I called her for a date. I remember where he took me, took me dancing, and Every time we got on the floor, I think the only conversation, the only words out of my mouth was, I can't breathe, you're holding me too tight. You know, I kept pulling away. I think in a sense that's the way he's, that, that should have, that's the way he's been ever since, really. <laughs> what was it that you loved about her? Well, she was very, uh, she was very beautiful and uh, very friendly and communicative, and uh, she was a nice Jewish girl, which I had to uh, think about seriously because I, I couldn't think about her, fix her. I would have been dis disowned, and. Uh, there was just something about her, uh, it's hard for me to describe, but there was a, a real magnetism. He invited me down to uh, 
pen for a big fraternity weekend, and I wanted to go to that because I'd never been to one before. I'd never been out of Rockaway by myself before. So this was a, a great chance to get away. And he invited me down, and that weekend I was so angry at him that he had to take me to the train station, and I said, that's it. I don't want to see you anymore. And he was so upset that he got on the train, and the train took off. And uh, he rode to the next stop, and I don't remember how one or two stops more, and tried to make peace and promise he won't do it again, and that kind of... What did he do? That kind of thing. That, to assault me all the time, to attack me physically, which mm -hmm. I... I did not want, I didn't want it to be like that. <laughs> I wanted it to be romantic. Were you dating other people too or not? Well, when I was in dental school, I was, yeah, in the army, yeah. Of course I was dating, uh, you know, just going out. I wasn't, uh, because she wasn't available when I was in all different parts of the country. I think what happened after that is that I really wanted to know what sex was like. And I wasn't going to, uh, to, uh, you know, call up somebody that I saw once in a while and say have sex and so a little bit every time and every time he fought we went a little further and at that point I really wanted to know what it was like. I Meanwhile, I kept writing to mommy back and forth. He used to write me these, what he considered love letters all the time. And I started to think, and I liked sex, so I started to think, well, maybe this is the way it is. Maybe this is the most I can feel. Uh, and, and, I think that if I was willing to have sex with somebody, I think I must marry him. That, I, it, for me to say this now seems so incredible that I thought that once, that it's hard for me to believe. I had a hemorrhoid operation and I, when I was in Camp Hood, and I, they gave me a 30-day sick leave. So that's when I called mommy, I tell her I got the 30 day sick leave, I'm not, I'm not going overseas, and I'm coming home, I want to get married. You know, at that time you had to get a Wasserman to get a marriage license, a blood test. I mean, he'd call, like, as I remember it, every week to say, I got the Wasserman, you know, you can't keep wasting it. And I kept saying, no, no, I don't want to get married, I don't want to get married. Did she say yes right away? Oh, yeah, of course, I'm married. Marry a dentist, you know. Well, I... Well, I, I more or less, uh, I didn't take no for an answer, you know. She just had to marry me. <laughs> I was very domineering then. And very, you know, uh, insistent and... Uh, no, she, uh, she gave in. I think now, and I'm quite sure of this in retrospect, although I was totally not aware of it, I think it was time for me to get out of the house and be, be without my father and mother. Uh, I didn't want to move far away from them, but I didn't, nor did I want to live with them anymore. It was time. I think you know what it's like? It's like playing musical chairs. Do you, I don't know if you've ever played that game around, but you walk around in a circle, and when the music stops, you sit down on a chair because it's time. And I think that's why I got married. I was curious about the love letters my mother mentioned. When I asked her if she had saved them, she said, oh no, I would have thrown those out long ago. But soon after, a shoebox full of them turned up in my father's dresser drawer. His and hers. I have been reveling in your accounts of how you love me. I have been marking off some more days on the calendar. I have been missing you like an arch misses the keystone. 
I have been longing for you like the parched earth longs for rain. And I have been loving you and adoring you like I always will love and adore you. How about that? <laughs> Pésame, pésame mucho Each time I cling to your kiss I hear music divine Pésame mucho This is Third Valentine's Day, I've been away from you, and I love you very much, dear, and miss you, so that really hurts me physically, mentally, and spiritually. You are so near, and yet so far. Yeah, I didn't think I was an English major, do I write these things? Why are you? <laughs> Every day, about this time after work, when I come to my room, I sit down at my desk and stare at your picture, and sort of talk to you. I tell you how much I love you and miss you. I took out your lock of hair and smell it and kissed it. I'm, I'm crazy, yes, about you and always will be. You sent me a piece of hair. Sometimes words are wonderful because of the thoughts they convey, and sometimes they are wonderful because of the way they are used and the music they play. Yours, Harold, are wonderful for both reasons. I love the way you talk about eating me, the way you say that I sure do know how to serve myself. If I am very appetizing, it is because you give me inspiration to be so. That's, who is this? I'm not, I'm not. That's it? That's it? That's it on the I know. Should I go? Yeah. I was actually tickled pink when I read how you and your mother went to shop for an engagement ring. I'm so happy that you get such pleasure and such a thrill out of it. Dearest, it's an honor for me to be able to get you one. I'm still the luckiest guy in the world and always will be as long as you are mine. Today, I found a letter waiting for me when I came home. It was an unexpected letter. It was a thrilling letter. It was a sweet letter. I'm so touched because you had only gotten as far as Newark when you wrote to me. I want to mail this as soon as I get your new address. That's why I'm writing now. Honestly, Harold, getting that letter felt much better than taking off alligator pumps after walking in them all day. Sunshine, my moonlight, my heartbeat, my dream, my pulse, my everything. And I do anything for you. And even though I'm a bit hard to handle sometimes, dear, I really get over it very soon because my love for you is very real. And the only reason for living now and will always be till death do us part. And all yours come to me. Did I really write this shit? My heart is sad and lonely. I wait and sigh. We came home from Florida in cause 70. Just think maybe you rested your head where I had rested mine. This is when I was in college. My mother wanted to take me away from you, and she took me to Florida for a week, and we went by train. Why did your mother want you to get away from me? Because she saw a lot of things she didn't like. Why? 
Прабхупада ничего не делает. Прабхупада ничего не делает. The day yesterday started off wrong by not getting any mail from you. Then I went to see your mother, and when I saw all the mail your parents received from you, I couldn't stand it. Your father asked me to read your letters to him, and I struggled to keep my voice from cracking. Of course, if you had bothered and splurged by sending the one letter air mail, as well as to your parents, you, you could have saved me a great deal of misery. Am I not as important to you as they are? <laughs> Who is this person that we have? They've all changed. I've changed all the time. Uh, do you have the dates of these ones? Yeah. That must be. Yeah. The date for the day would be very important. I, I don't... This is like a stranger to me. Mm -hmm. Same way, I can't believe that we're so vocal in the uh, road. Like it's strange. So polished by now. With, with different people. With different people. a night of love Here we are together The moon is hanging low There's magic in its silvery light It seems to say the time is right Love me tonight Life is so uncertain And no one seems to know how long we have to linger on Tomorrow we may both be gone Love me tonight Oh, let me feel your arms And let me feel your kiss Then if this great big world must end Oh, let it end like this my lips are yours forever, my heart is in your hands, my love is yours to have to hold. Don't wait until the moon is old, love me tonight. I came back to New York and we got married 
I got a job uh, working for a dentist, like the Weinstein on uh, Madison Avenue and uh, 53rd Street, a real top, top uh, dentist. I'd been looking for a job for months, and then finally I got one, and I lasted one day because I totally couldn't stand it. So I don't remember how long it took me exactly until I got that job. Then I opened up on Main Street and uh, with Dr. Resnick, and that was, became like a professional building in East Rockaway. It didn't take long after I got the job that I became terribly attracted. Maybe it wasn't the first time, but the other times were when I was 13, 12, and 14, you know, it was the first time at a relatively adult age that I became terribly attracted. And then when that relationship started, going home every night was miserable. Back at the office on the second floor, there was room for a... Uh for a, uh, a one-bedroom apartment, a little, little kitchen we put together, and a bedroom, and a, and a den. It was very difficult to deal with because I didn't want to have sex anymore with him. I didn't want anyone else to touch me, and I knew that I had to, and I remember <laughs> for so long that every time that had to happen, I had to cry into the pillow because I didn't want him to hear me. In my practice work we started really boom, and I was amazed at you know uh, how successful I was getting, and uh, we uh, moved in. She became pregnant, and uh, she had to quit her job. The relationship Monday to Friday continued for five years. And at the end of five years, I told him that I couldn't do it anymore. It's not that I stopped feeling the way I, the way I did about him, but it was a terrible strain living a, a lie. I hated myself. I couldn't stand it anymore. And I remember the day that I left it was in January. After I said goodbye to him, I left. And the snow, I had to walk to the subway station. And the snow was coming down. Each flake was this big. They were the biggest flakes. And they were falling all over me and melting in with the tears. Well, that was a wonderful time in my life. In my life. That's, that was the, really the golden years. Everything worked out fine. You had a very successful practice, a successful marriage. He was always angry, and our social life, I was miserable with him also because he always drank too much, and then he would put his hands on other women, their asses, and their he, he, he would drink until he was out of control, and that was very humiliating to me. I was a boss, and whatever I wanted happened. He's not, he doesn't have nearly the same intensity I have. That's, that's what it is, and that's too bad, so it's a little difficult to share things with him. We have totally opposing interests and always have had. Even to this day, she's a terrific woman. Do you um, feel like you married the right person? No. <laughs> Do I? <laughs> Do I have to answer that? Oh, sure, absolutely. <laughs> sure. Do you, did you always feel that way? Was there ever a time? Always. Uh, always. Mm -hmm. I don't know if she feels that way, but I do. So they, they're married and they probably live the sort of, you know, typical suburban, like first generation Jewish from 
parents from Lower East Side move out to the suburbs. He's hard working on his set on the path to become, you know, a professional. And she's just like stifled, unfulfilled. So she starts taking art classes and Spanish lessons and volunteering for Hadassah. You know, she did all the she used to do all the decorations for the they had those dinner dances at the temple and she would always be on the decorating committee. And of course she made her all her own clothes. Everything was for show. The clothes, the, the dinner parties, everything was perfect. In all the interviews I did with my mother, she never even mentioned her two children. There was Ricky and there was me. There we were. The four of us in the ranch house on Long Island that was the family home for more than 50 years. Her whole life, mother would always, somebody would say, you'd walk down the street and, and they go, look at that cute baby. And she had this standard line every single time. She'd say, cute now. Wait till they start to be five and six and seven. Wait till they get to be teenagers. They're not cute. They don't stay cute for long. I mean. Every single time she would see, any time you'd even mention the word child, that was standard, oh yeah. While Annie took care of us kids, my mother kept busy decorating, entertaining, gardening, and sewing. And my father, when he wasn't fixing teeth or making real estate deals, prolifically documented us kids the house, and their exotic travels. All the while, they fought, obsessively and ceaselessly. There was no sense in that house that it was like a family, that we were like a family and we were like a unit, you know, we, and we could count on each other. My mother enlisted us as foot soldiers in her own private army. The enemy, my father. The weapon, Secrets. There were all kinds of things we had to keep hidden from him. Don't tell Daddy. Don't tell your father. He'll be mad. He'll be angry. He'll punish you. He'll punish me. He'll have a heart attack. Our house was like a black hole, a place where no light or matter ever escaped. There were no boundaries. Nothing felt safe. Ricky and I tried to flee the madness by hiding under our beds, isolated, even from each other. My mother seemed strangely oblivious to all of this. The truth was, even when she was there, she always seemed to be somewhere else. Of course, it might have had something to do with the fact that she'd never forgotten the man she'd loved and left early in her marriage. My boss was a very lovely man who did not come on strongly, but he had to spend a lot of time with me because he had a lot to teach me about what I was going to be doing there. So this relationship was a very gradual one took time to build up. But he was married and had a sick child. And we fell in love. Before you were married? Yes. Before I was married. Oh. Last time you said it was after you were married. After I got married, and Harold was still away in, in Texas, the relationship really, really bloomed, and I was, we both were 
madly in love and that was a wonderful time by it's almost like looking looking away from everything to one face and you become face to face with everything it's it's like that it was like that we never talked about well the big thing was him leaving his wife he never talked about that i don't know if it was because he knew her from childhood and the families always expected them to be married. I felt that even if he would do it, that I didn't see how you could build a building on such a hurtful relationship, all the hurt that we would inflict. My marriage was not good. I married the wrong man. We had some very bad times. We also had some very wonderful times. I don't think that if I had not been married to him, I would ever have had some of the most wonderful experiences of my life in different parts of the world. And I think about them all the time, and I'm very grateful to him for that. But there was a, a big price to pay. She married me. Now, I could have married other women, but uh, I don't know how that would have lasted, but at least this one lasted. So you remember basically you were always happy and you traveled and you oh, had yeah. kids? Oh, yeah. I was very lucky. Compared to the, uh, the women a lot of my friends had, the wives. No, she never, uh, she never, she would complain, but they were ever uh, I was a decision maker then, and not anymore. What happened? Well, she, as she got older, she changed. She became very domineering. No, I don't know of any other woman I'd be uh, happy with. Even though she's domineering? Mm hmm Even though she's domineering? Yeah, I mean, I'm getting used to it. Okay. It's, a, it's a give and take. It's a give and take proposition. If if you want to marry Shalaz, you got you got to take also. Or what will give? No, she criticizes me all the time for different. I, I wear sloppy clothes. I don't know how to wash dishes right. I I don't eat the right food. I. I don't In all those years when you were raising kids, did you ever see or speak to? the man that you were in love with? He disappeared into California. And I never stopped thinking about him. It may sound strange, 
but I don't really have any childhood memories of my father. When he was around, which wasn't often, he was usually lurking behind the camera, watching me through the lens. My mom was a glittering fairy queen, radiant and beautiful and perfect. Like a fluffy frosted cake with creamy roses you weren't supposed to touch. And then there was Annie. Annie was there when I was born and took care of me until I was 10. It was she who I've always felt was my real mother. coming home all the all along and your mother she well she would you know take care of you too but she almost went someplace every day and uh, then I would have to take care of you and some days she would spend in the city all day she would go shopping so I actually spent much more time with you than with her oh yes yes much much more because then I would get you ready for bed at night, give you your bath and wash your hair and all that stuff. Then we just like sort of grew and grew. As the years went by, we just like grew together. You were your power. Look down on them and bless them. Take care of them. These blessings we ask in thy son's name. Amen. 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 Hey, man. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and your dressing, what kind of dressing you want? You gonna eat some homemade. of this dressing? Homemade. <laughs> <laughs> I'm selling it. <laughs> I might try to pick on some on the other side on one little corner. Before. Oh. <laughs> You're supposed to have faith in me. Well, I oh, tell y'all, I'm not going to have that. I don't want it at all. <laughs> I get it up. Mr. J used to do hats in Harlem when I was there. He was the day person for doing hats. Mm -hmm. My friend Catherine, he used to make hats for him. Which is the front of this one? It, that's somewhere about the front. Mm -hmm. How that, do you decide? Do you decide? Do you decide by what mood you're in? What? What? Oh, that's a great one. Isn't it? I have a suit to that one. Oh, oh, Lonnie, what you wear with that one? I have a blue suit. A blue That's suit. Beautiful. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you have to try with this one. Mm -hmm. Oh. Oh, that's with beautiful. This hat. Look, look, look. That's great on you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> look. Sandy. Yes. <laughs> I love this one. Oh, send it down. Look, yeah, look, yeah, look, 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 look,
And it it was, I could tell it, you know, it was hurtful to her, you know. And you didn't like going to the temple, but you liked going to church with me. Maybe that was like getting t too close or something. And I said, well, it'll get, it'll, it'll be all right. I can handle it, you no. Know? But it, it got to where I couldn't handle it. And what it's do you starting to handle me. Do you remember what you said? I said, I, I said, I got to get out of here. That's what I said. Not to me. No, 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 not to you. <laughs> Can you remember anything specific about when you told me you were going to leave? Oh, you were a heartbroken little child. I hate, I, I dread it telling you. Because you wanted to know how come you couldn't go, you know, or how come I couldn't stay, you know. And I didn't want to tell you the truth, but... Uh, Why well, wouldn't I? I don't think I would have understood. Yeah, that's what I figured, that you wouldn't. Yeah, no, if it had been up to me, I would have, like, left with you. I'd probably be living down here with you. <laughs> I, it's true. <laughs> Yeah, I believe that. Yeah, I do believe that. If, I mean, if, if she had let you go when I left, you would have went right along. I would have. I think that was probably when I knew I would yeah. have to go. Did I? I think so too, Sandy. I think you would have gone right along with me. When I was 18, I fell in love for the first time. I was trying to describe to my mother how I felt when she started to cry and said she had felt that way once too and proceeded to tell me the story of her lover. I was furious. First of all, she completely undermined my story. And second of all, I couldn't understand how she could have left the man she really loved. I remember her saying three things. It may not have worked. There are no guarantees. And you have to learn to settle for what you have. So basically, what she taught me was that you can't really be with the person you love. Romantic love is one thing. Real life is another. When my parents were in their early 70s, they got hit coming from the beach by a speeding Corvette. And it wasn't hurt, but I was. And that accident, although, you know, I recovered from it fine, it really made a change in me because up until that day, I had this feeling that young people have that I would go on forever. And it was the first time I had ever faced my own mortality. And that's when I decided that I wanted him to know what a difference he made. And that's when that idea started to look for him, which took a long time. To, I really didn't know how to do it. It took a long time, and, but Ricky helped me, and she really did it. She said to me, how would you, if, tell me something, you know about fact finding and you know about travel writing, let's just say you wanted to find somebody that was in another state, there's no way to do it, is there? So I said, mother, if you want to find somebody bad enough, you can find anybody. One day she called and said, I found him. So what did you do? So I wrote him a letter. And I still have a copy of it. And I told him that I just thought that he would like to know 
what a difference knowing him made to me and how happy he made me. So presumably that's all I wanted to do was tell him. However, I did put a return address, Ricky's address, on the envelope just in case. And he answered it. Okay, wait. My mother makes this sound like it was a piece of cake. But I can tell you, it wasn't. She needed help with everything. My father controlled every aspect of her life. He paid the bills and examined everything with a fine-tooth comb. So she couldn't make a call to California without him saying, who'd you call in California? She didn't have her own credit card or her own checks. She couldn't even leave the house without him asking where she was going. And she certainly couldn't get mail without him seeing it. Eventually, as the correspondence with her lover heated up, my sister helped her get a post office box three towns away, and she'd drive there every couple of weeks disguised in a big hat and sunglasses. So the letters came and went and came and went, and they were wonderful. And he liked mine. And after I don't know if he, a year, maybe two years, I don't know, but one day I got a letter and he said, I have to come to New York on business. What do you think of us seeing each other? I remember writing back and saying, no, I always, I always use this quote of Robert Frost's, my life is a risk I have to take and sometimes I do and that's what I wrote back to him. Yes, I'll do it. And we did it. Ricky gave us her apartment and we met there and spent the afternoon together. So here I had to step in and he was coming to Manhattan and of course since I was so guilty and I was so bad and it caused her all these horrible problems from the minute I was born, well what else could I do but say sure you can meet in my apartment. My mother told my father she was going to a ceramics class at the new school. She put on her dirty old ceramics clothes, and in her clay-covered tote bag, she threw her black silk stockings, her tight black skirt, her high-heeled shoes, and her makeup bag. She got to my sister's apartment a few hours early, changed her clothes, put on her makeup, put out some sandwiches for lunch, and waited for him. Later that night, she called to tell me there was a knock on the door, and when she opened it, there he stood with her favorite flowers. It was as if no time had passed at all. It had been 40 years since they'd last seen each other. He was 37, she was 31. Now, in their 70s, they became lovers again. And from then on, we arranged you know, to see each other whenever we could it was only once a year. After the meeting in New York City, they arranged through many months and they would meet in a, in a place in the United States. They would both fly to this place and stay in a hotel. Her story to my father was that she was going on a press trip with myself. I couldn't answer the phone for four days because that second trip, I was supposed to be with her physically. And just in case my father would call, who knows, to check up on her, or maybe he dialed the wrong number, you know, you never know, but I couldn't answer my telephone. I did once answer it, because I would sometimes, after a couple of days, I'd get so fed up, so I'd pick up the phone, just listen without saying anything, and I heard Daddy's voice, and he said, hello, I think he either made a mistake or he was checking up, and I just flipped. That That was the bad thing. See, I, I don't even remember, because it was so horrible, and I had to hang up on it. Maybe I wasn't directly complicit in my mother's affair, but I certainly had no objection to it. In fact, I admired what she did. 
I was thrilled that she was finally showing some courage for the first time in her life. It didn't happen right away, but eventually I decided I wanted to meet her lover. I flew out to California and had lunch with him in a Chinese restaurant. I adored him instantly and felt that this was the man who should have been my father. In the trunk of my rental car were two camera rigs and two tape decks. I was determined to record an interview with him and I was terrified that something might go wrong. But he wouldn't let me record him at all. Not one word. The last time I saw him, we were in Arizona, and all of a sudden, he got up without saying anything, and he walked across the room, and I didn't like the way he was, for some reason, he was walking in a different way, and he, opened, he always took two rooms, incidentally, adjoining rooms and he went into the other room and he closed the door and he had never done that before. And when he got up, oh, at least an hour had passed by. He said to me, I want to tell you something. He said, if anything happens to me while I'm with you, after you call 911, I want you to disappear. And I knew I couldn't do that. A few weeks later, she received this letter from him. How do I even begin? I bless the day you wrote that first letter, signed capital P. And idiot that I am, I didn't know it was you. And like you, I'm not sure I know you or enough about you. But then, one never really knows anyone, let alone himself. You are correct. You are usually right about such matters when you wrote that we will probably not see each other again. We both know why. God knows it isn't not for lack of desire, but sometimes circumstances dictate intent and desire. I have loved your letters. I have loved your presence. I have loved your body. I have loved being loved by you. You brought a spark into my life, a passion that I thought long lost. But time has eaten away at us. Not that the love and passion is gone, but the years do cost us. I did not know or realize that I had a hole in my life, a hole which you filled and which gave me a new spirit, which even in your absence continues on. All of this, mind you, is not written in the black hole of a depression, quite the reverse. It is celebratory. It cries out that we found each other, reveled in each other, and I shall never forget what you offered and gladly gave to me. I adore you and will never forget you and will ever be thankful that you came into my life, no matter how late. And then there's a quote from Thomas Wolfe wrote, remembering speechlessly, we seek the great forgotten language, the lost lane into heaven, a stone, a leaf, an unfound door, where, when, unquote. In you I found my answers, and I cherish you and what you gave me. My mother called me when she got the letter and read it to me over the phone. We both cried. She grieved for about two weeks, and then somehow pulled herself out of it and got back to her real life. No, we didn't have that. That was not, yeah, that, didn't she have the pink marble? Oh, here he is. Hi, Scoots. Here he is. Hi, Scootski. Here he is. Hi. He's such a good boy. What does he think of the zebra? Good. Well, 
the zebra. Because he likes it. He likes the zebra <laughs> more than I do. But the, he won't. The trouble is, he scratches it up and he's, 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 he's looking at it. He's scratching it up. It was always scratched up. He didn't scratch it up. Look, what, what are you talking about? Look at this. Oh, it was always like that. It wasn't always like that. Well, I don't see him scratch it up at all. Yeah. He just likes to he sit does. on Look it. Look at this. That was always like that. It wasn't it? always like that. This is, this is uh, shit from him. It, no, it isn't. Feel it. Harold. He knows you're bad-mouthing him, Daddy. Sunday. Yeah. I don't like it at all. The rug? Remember we used to hide it in the closet? When you get it off, it's... You'll be able to get that off, I think, but you might need some soap or something. Alga is coming this weekend, Harold. I don't want Alga to bother with it. Tell you what happened in the last three weeks. He, in a great many ways, I noticed that he had changed. For example, his walk became different. Instead of taking steps, he started to shuffle. More and more, he sat in his chair with the television on, but sleeping. Plus, you know, he, he fell six times. And sometimes it was very hard to get him up. But he always insisted he was fine. So that he didn't want to go to the doctor with me to see why this was happening. And I couldn't get him to. And then I bought lamb chops. One day I was with him and uh, I said, what would you like for dinner tonight? So he said, oh, we're right here, there's a butcher in Hewitt. He said, why don't you make lamb chops? I said, fine. I went in and the next thing I say is going to have some importance, perhaps only in my head, but she didn't have baby lamb chops, which is what I wanted. And Daddy said, well, but she has another nice one here. And the butcher said, yes, this will be fine. I'll just trim it out of, of everything. The reason is that this is so important to me is I keep thinking at night that maybe because baby lamb chops only has one big bone and I don't think there'd be anything to swallow. So this, this bothers me, but I made the, it was a big lamb chops and when I gave it to him, he ate for a while and then he started to cough. And then he couldn't stop coughing, so he went to the sink and bent over it and coughed some more. And I started pounding him on the back and it, he seemed like he was getting worse. So I called 911 and as, they came very quickly. And as soon as they walked into the kitchen, they put him down on the floor. They had all kinds of instruments with them, long tubes. And they worked on him for about five minutes, and then they said, we have to take him to the hospital because they have things that we don't have there to help this. So they took him in the ambulance, and Daddy was gone someplace where I couldn't see where he was. And about five minutes, they came out and said he died so fast. I was in the bathtub when my husband came in and told me my dad was dead. I thought he was kidding, but 16 hours later, I was sitting around a large table at Spotnitz Funeral Home with the family. 
The guy in the shark skin suit with the clammy skin and the bad toupee looked at my mother and asked whether it was true that the deceased wished to be cremated. My mother said yes. And what did the deceased wish to be done with the cremains, he asked. My mother stared off into space and said, I want half my ashes in the Atlantic Ocean and half in the grave. I elbowed her hard and said, Mom, it's Dad who died, not you. As if awakened from a dream, she replied, Oh, yes, this isn't about me. If this was a preview of coming attractions, I was in trouble. I mean, who in the world was going to replace Harold, who had always done everything for her? I realized very, very soon afterwards that I didn't want to live in this house anymore. But I didn't cry much. I had a lot to do. I really didn't cry. I had a lot to do. And I kept very busy. The first one is off. Five months before my father died, I took my mom to see an assisted living building in Lower Manhattan, trying to prepare them for the future. My mom fell in love with the place and went home to tell my dad all about it. Without looking up from the TV, he said, Great, I'm glad you'll have somewhere to go when I'm dead. So now, three weeks after his death, she was ready to move. All dressed up. No place to go. No place to go. I had heard it said that moving is almost as traumatic as death. Suddenly, Phyllis was taking on both at once. She was leaving behind everything she had known for 60 years. Japan. Cindy. Japan. Japan. Acapulco. Who was that with? That was with a couple, I don't even remember. We met them there and spent the time with them, and that was the end. This is for knitting. I, I think I should throw this out. Or put them in the knitting bag. Yeah, it's not something everybody uses. Okay, so that's done. You mean that whole thing is empty? Yeah. So is all that. This is the kind of stuff you have to start doing without me. Because I can't, otherwise it's never going to happen. I can't, I think that now what you should begin is books. I think you should look in every room, pick any books you want, put them on the dining room table and we'll put them in the You see, the thing is, I don't know what to do with Daddy's books. Look what he has. Mom, you don't have to worry about what to do with. All you have to do is worry about picking what you want. I don't even remember what's in here. You look. Oh, look at that hat. Better try it on. Wow. <laughs> it got too tight on me. Where am I gonna wear this? Where am I gonna wear this? It's beautiful, but where am I gonna wear it? I mean, unless you would wear, I don't, I don't think, I don't think it looks great with short hair, really. It's, I didn't buy, see, I had long hair when I bought it. I had long hair when I bought it. I had a lot of hair here. Yeah. No. I no. I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. You know anybody who could use a beautiful hat? Should I ever do anything else in life but so? I made this for something and I can't even remember what. I made an evening gown and this the collar. Crazy.
In the midst of the packing, it occurred to me that my mother's lover should know that Harold had died. So I told him. He was very sympathetic and asked me to tell her he'd be calling. for you to talk. A lot of people have that now. Okay. Could I ask you some questions? Do you remember you took me, used to take me to a little place where we, in a little booth where we could play good records and listen to music? You remember that? You do? Oh, that's so, that, that's so great. I'm so glad. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay, I'm just packing up. I'm moving into New York because that's where I belong and that's where I always want to be and that's what I'm doing. I'm going to live at, on Battery Park City. It's on the Hudson and you can see the Statue of Liberty from there. But uh, anytime you feel like talking to me, as you, or writing me a note, you, you can now. <laughs> Uh, I'm supposed to be moving November 17th. If you want to call me, be... Uh -huh. when you, you know, when you feel better, because I don't like to ask you so many questions when it's a strain for you to answer. In fact, I wanted to, I wanted to tell you something, but I think I'm going to wait until you feel better. No, I can't. I think you have to feel better for this so I can hear your reaction. Okay? So you can call me anytime. Okay, I want you to feel better. And go have some tea. I hope so. Okay. Goodbye, huh? Goodbye, love you. Bye. Oh, he can hardly. <laughs> Tell me something. What do you do? Tip one man, the boss, for all of them, or tip each one separately? I don't know. How many men are there here? Do you know? I think there's four. Four. I don't know what to do about that. Tip the main guy. First time experience. <laughs>
good, freshly painted. Mm -hmm. I can't believe I, I did this. They placed a six. Yeah. And he said the best meal he ever had was in Franco, who lived on a sixth floor of what fifth yeah, floor? What street? For she's a jolly good fellow. For she's a jolly good fellow. For she's a jolly good fellow. Nobody can deny, which nobody can deny. Da, 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 da. Everybody was feeling merry, so where it went home. Don't cry. Look how pretty the cake is. Look at A few months after my mother moved, she asked me to take her back to see the house. She was homesick for her pool and her patio and her garden. I knew it would upset her but I had to tell her what had happened. Mom, these pictures were taken just after the house was knocked down. Oh my God. Jeez. So remember, that's the front. Well, it's hard to, it's hard to, it's hard to find the front for me. Well, no, here, the 251, this is the post that was by the front path. So this is actually looking at where the house was, but the ha this whole thing is, the house is gone. And they put oh, up this fence. Oh, it's shocking. It's only a house. Why should I be so shocked? I wanted you to see these before, if you really were going to go out there, because I knew you'd be. It is shocking. Wow. See, there again, you can see the... Mm -hmm. But uh, all the plants and flowers and... Oh, it's only a house. It's only a house. building? I am in a very good place for me, yes, I am. I am. Yeah, in every way, really. Mm -hmm. I and mean, you really seem happier than I've ever seen you. Really? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because I have a, such a sense of freedom, you know, right. to do what I want. You know, and I don't have to account to anybody. If I want to take a walk, I don't have to ask anybody. If I want to explore Soho, I don't have to ask anybody. I can do anything. And that's really a, a flight of the bird. That was hard to do in Hillwood. Yeah. In, in your whole life, really, you've never been able to do that. No. No. It's a big thing. My whole life, that's true. Congratulations. <laughs> if he came back just for a minute or for a few minutes or something, what would you, is there anything you would... Who's he? Daddy. Is there anything you would want to say to him or... 
any way that you would be... If he came back for five minutes? Or ten or whatever. I would make him happy. Because I would know it was only ten minutes. <laughs> How would you do that? I would tell him I miss him and I love him. Over a little bit? Okay, good. For a few months, my mom really enjoyed her new life. She even found a new suitor, though she never remembered his name. But her wings were clipped by a series of falls. In the space of 18 months, she broke first her arm, then her other arm, then her kneecap, and then seven ribs. The shock of each fall erased more and more of her memory and gradually, along with a lot of other things, her lover was forgotten. Shortly after the last fall, she contracted pneumonia from which she never recovered. In the days before she died, as my mom lay hour after hour with her eyes closed, I asked her if she thought about Harold. It took a long time for her to answer, then she said, sometimes. And when you think about him, what do you think, I asked her. Again, after a long silence, she said, he showed me the world. A few months after my mother died, I had this dream. I'm on the deck of a ship, and my parents are on camels in the desert, there to see me off. I realize I haven't put my luggage on board, and call to them, asking if they've seen it. Don't worry, they call back. It's all on the ship. We've loaded it for you. Relieved and grateful, I thank them, and wave to them as they turn and ride off into the desert. I set sail with all the baggage they'd given me, both a burden and a gift.
Te amaré, te amaré como al mundo, te amaré aunque tenga final. Te amaré, te amaré en lo profundo, te amaré como tengo que amar, te amaré, te amaré como puedo. siguiente además te amaré te amaré como si Te amaré como único ser, te amaré hasta el fin de los tiempos, te amaré y después Te amaré.